today, Brian Sullivan with the with the Security Development Lifecycle team at Microsoft is going to talk to us about cryptographic agility. It's actually a really cool idea for a talk, so please uh, please join me in welcoming him. Thanks, everyone. So uh, my name is Brian Sullivan. I'm with the SDL team, or I'm a security PM on the SDL team at Microsoft, and uh, you're all here today to learn about crypto agility. So I should probably start off, what is, what is crypto agility? Well, crypto agility is the ability of an application to change whatever types of cryptographic algorithms or, or the particular implementations of those algorithms, to be able to change this in configuration without having to make changes to the source code itself, without having to go recompile it or, or issue patches. Um, a properly designed application should just be able to be reconfigured um, basically by the end user or, or the, the administrator um, with, without even having to have access to the source code. So you're all here to learn about this, but unfortunately, that's, uh, that's not what this talk is really about. Um, there's, been, there's been so much O'Day dropped at Black Hat this year, I thought, I would, uh, I thought I'd drop a little bit of my own. So uh, instead of crypto agility today, what I want to talk about is how to break the RSA algorithm. Um, now, some of you know, um, RSA is based on the fact that it's really hard to factor large numbers. So the, the, the core of RSA is you start and you take, you take two really, really big primes, like many, many, like thousands of digits long or however. Um, and you construct this number n from these two large primes, p and q. Um, now this n gets put into the public key, whereas the p and q get put into part of the private key. And the entire strength of RSA is based on the fact that it's really difficult to get P and Q back out of N. People have been trying to find an easy way to do this since like the, the, the dawn of mathematics. Um, so RSA has been really, really safe um, until now. So um, if you look at this, if you, 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 probably, you probably recognize a lot of this math here. If you, if you apply the, the Ermite interpolation, which is in, in the top here, to the, uh, to the Chinese remainder theorem, and I want you to set aside for now any kind of linear homomorphisms of the minor ring M over K, um, what you find is the entry summation of the results of the Cantor Bernstein's Trader equation give us a first approximation of these roots um, P and Q. Um, are there any, any, any questions? So, like, the math is going to get a little, little more complicated after this. So if there's any questions, like, raise your hand now. No? Okay, we're good. Keep going. Okay, no. It's, it's, it's all a joke. Um, it, it really is a talk about crypto agility. I really haven't, I really haven't broken RSA. I probably wouldn't just drop it as an O-Day on Black Hat if I did. Um, but do you think, do you think it's that far-fetched to think that someone ever would do that? I don't, I personally don't think it's that far-fetched at all. I think at some black hat some year, or some DEF CON some year, you know, some, some security reacher is, is, is going to do what I just pretended to do right there, and say, hey everybody, guess what, I just, I just cracked AES, or, you know, I just cracked SHA-2, it's, it's now worthless. Um, and if, if you think it is too far-fetched, look what happened just a couple years ago, in 2008. Um, Sodorov and a bunch of the really smart guys uh, got up on stage at uh, KS Communication Congress. And they said, hey, you know what? Uh, we're, we're practicing this like MD5 collision uh, um, attack we have. We just got a bunch of PlayStation 3s and networked them together. And oh, by the way, now we can, we can, we can create ourselves certificates to impersonate any site on the internet. It's like, whoa, okay. So, I mean, there have been theoretical problems with MD5 for years. But here, like, a few guys just got together and, like, broke the entire structure of it. Um, so this, this kind of thing can, can and does happen. And not only, it's been, it's been happening for, for thousands of years. Like, if, if you look at the history of cryptography, it's really this kind of arms race between code makers and code breakers. And sometimes code makers have the upper hand, like it, like it appears to be now, like all the, all the agri algorithms we use appear to be pretty good. Um, and sometimes code breakers get the upper hand. But it seems like whenever, whenever code makers get the upper hand in this arms race, there's all this, I don't know, arrogance or whatever, like these codes are unbreakable. Like this is the one time in history, I know we've said this every time in history up until now, but this is the one time that the codes really are unbreakable. And they never are. Like, the codes that are unbreakable always get broken. It, I mean, go back, go back 2,000 years. So, like, this is, the, this is the Caesarean cipher right here. The Caesarean cipher was a cipher so strong. We're standing in Caesar's palace. 
This is a cipher so strong, Julius Caesar used to communicate all his battle plans, essentially conquer the world. But do you know what the Caesarian cipher was? It's rot three. Like A moves three places down the alphabet to D. B moves three places down the alphabet to E. It's ridiculous. It's so simple. You could, like, today, a, a kindergartner could break the Caesarian cipher. But 2,000 years ago, you could use this to, to conquer the world. Like, if, if, if Schneier had been around 2,000 years ago, we'd now be in, like, Bruce's palace because, because he would have realized how ridiculous the cipher was. Um, th the point of all this is that it's, it's very foolish to assume that the cryptography we're using today won't be broken tomorrow. It, every, every, time, every time this happens, uh, it always gets broken. Oh, yeah, sorry. I, I, if it, did, anybody, did anybody see before I moved? Did anybody break the Caesarean cipher? Be sure to drink your Ovaltine. Any, any Christmas story fans here? A couple? OK. Um, so what would, what would the consequences be if this were to happen? If, if, some, if, someone were to, uh, if someone were to come along and say, hey, oh, by the way, I really did break RSA. Well, what you'd have to do is you'd have to go into all your applications, and you'd have to find all the places where you have that algorithm. You'd have to change that code. You'd have to rebuild, make sure it still works. You'd have to retest, make sure there are no weird consequences. And now you have to deploy patches to however many users you have, which could be and maybe it's a few dozen, maybe it's a few hundred, maybe it's hundreds of million users, depending on, on who you write software for. And you know, this could be a pretty big window of attack. If you're talking about products on the order of you know, millions or more of users, it's going to take you a while to get through all these steps. No matter what your, what your intentions are, your capabilities, it, it's, it's just, it's just going to take a while. Um, and this is a big window of attack for someone to exploit you. And even if, even if none of this matters to you, you're like, look, look, Brian, you're crazy. No one's ever going to break it. I know what history has told me, but I don't believe you. There, there, are other, there are other practical concerns to this as well. You want to sell your software in a different country? Well, every different country has, has different crypto requirements. Like, the, the algorithms we use in the States are different than the ones in the EU. Like, EU likes Whirlpool. Um, I, like, Russia has their, their very own uh, particular ideas of what, uh, of what cryptography should be. Even, even just inside the United States alone, if you want to sell to the feds, you've got to be FIPS 140 compliant, so Federal Information Processing Standard 140. And this basically says what, what algorithms you can and can't use. And, and above and beyond that, it not only tells you what algorithms you can and can't use, it tells you what particular implementations of those algorithms you can and can't use. And you know what? Sometimes the FIPS certified implementations of the algorithms are actually slower, less performant, than the ones that are not FIPS certified. So now you've got to make a choice. You've either got to make a choice for your users that I want everybody to be, have the best performance possible, or I want to be able to sell to the feds. Well, that's kind of a tough choice, um, but if you, if you implement crypto agility in the right way, you don't have to make that choice. You can have the best of both worlds for everybody. You can have uh, the feds have their own particular implementations and everybody else have the fast ones. What's the solution for this? Well, the solution is we're going to plan for it from the beginning. We're going to assume that anything we use can and will be defeated in the, in the lifetime of the application. And so we're going to code this app in a cryptographically agile manner. Um, so the, one, one of the primary audiences I want to talk to you today are anybody in the audience who's, um, who's a, a solutions architect or a developer. There's going to be a lot of stuff in here for you guys on how to build apps cryptographically agile. Um, if, you're, if you're not this way, let's say you're more of a pen tester kind of person. Uh, when you're doing code reviews, there's going to be a lot of stuff in here for you to look for to say, hey, next time you do a code review, hey guys, this, this uh, pattern using here, this construct, this is not a cryptographically agile pattern. I want you to change it. If that's not you, and you're more on the, if you're more on the operations side, um, there's plenty of stuff in here for you too. There is, uh, I'm, I'm going to be focusing on three main uh, development frameworks today. Uh, two of the three of these actually have some measure of agility uh, built in by default. So even if the dev knew nothing of, of the agility features of the framework when they wrote it, there are still things you can do to, to reconfigure in, in right and wrong ways. So there should be something here for, uh, for everyone. 
So what, what do we, where do we start? What's the first step towards crypto agility? Well, the first step is you want to avoid any kind of hard-coded algorithm. Well, that, that's pretty obvious. Like, if you hard-code an algorithm in, you're not going to be able to change it without making a code change. But this is, this is easier said than done. How, how, do you, how do you avoid that hard-coded algorithm? Uh, the best way, I think, to do this um, is we're going to take advantage of some of the features of object-oriented code. Um, so what are, what are the four tenets of object orientation? Well, there's inheritance and polymorphism and encapsulation and abstraction. And all of these are important, and we're going to talk about all of these, uh, but abstraction is the most important one, so we're going to cover that first. And let me explain what I mean by abstraction. Um, who here, okay, who here doesn't already have one of these phones? Okay, oh, a, lot, a lot more than I thought, surprising. How many people want one? A couple, okay. Um, l less than I would have guessed. Um, I would say that nobody here really wants one of these. And I'm not saying that because of anything my company makes, anything like that. I'm, I'm just saying in general, you don't, you don't want one of these phones. You do want the ability to make a phone call. You want the ability to make a video phone call. You want the ability to run iPhone apps. But these are, these are things you want to do. These are activities. The phone in itself is just a means to an end. It's the same with like, like an, if I put an Xbox up here. Nobody wants an Xbox. You want the ability to play Xbox games. You don't want a Blu-ray player. You want the ability to watch movies in your home in high def. This is, you want the thing, you don't, you don't care about the box. What you want is the activity. And you have to start thinking about cryptography in the same way. You don't want to use RSA. You don't want to use SHA-2. You may want to, uh, to write a message. You may want to write out a secret so that only people you want to be able to read it can read it. That's something you want to do. You want to send a message so that everybody knows that it came from you and it wasn't tampered with. That's, that's something you really want to do. You don't care about the particular algorithm involved. That's the way you have to start thinking about it. And I know, I know it's kind of heresy for a security guy to stand at Black Hat and talk about a security feature, no less, and say stop caring about how it works, just care about what it does. But that's what's going to have to happen in order for crypto agility to work the right way. Stop caring about the particulars and just care about what it is that it does. So here are the three frameworks we're going to talk about today. Um, the first is .NET, obviously a Microsoft solution, our, our managed code uh, product framework. Um, I'm also going to talk about JCA, not ours, um, Java cryptography architecture. And I'm going to talk about CNG, which is crypto API next generation, which is uh, another Microsoft API for um, Vista in 2008 and Win7, uh, native C, C++ API. Now, I know two of the three of these are Microsoft. I promise I will not be biased in any way. I'm going to take a very critical look at each and every one of these. I think these are the three best frameworks out there if they're used the right way. But I'm going to take a very critical and unbiased look at all of them. They've all got their pros. They've all got their cons. We're going to cover all of that. I'm also going to take a look, a really, a really brief look at the end at a few more frameworks, um, some, some pretty popular ones, and explain um, how close they are to, uh, to joining the list here. Um, there's, there's kind of like Bouncy Castle, uh, especially, I think is, is really close to being agile and, and almost made this list. So we'll, we'll, we'll cover some more of these in the end if, you're, if your favorite isn't represented here. We're going to start with .NET, because that's just that's my main background. That's what I use on a day-to-day -day basis. So .NET cryptography is uh, basically uh, incorporated into the system.security.cryptography namespace, spread out, or spread out over a couple different uh, assemblies in the, uh, in the framework. It works on the basis of um, kind of these top-level abstract classes. Um, so these, are, these classes, they're, they're abstract, they can't be instantiated, but they do have some, some functionality built into them in terms of base class and, and factory classness that we'll talk about in a second. Um, it, it breaks down like this. So uh, the first one on the list is symmetric algorithm. This basically covers um, secret key cryptography. Um, asymmetric algorithm covers public key cryptography. Hashes cover hashes. That's pretty, pretty straightforward. Um, keyed hash is actually another top-level abstract that derives from hash, and HMAC uh, is another abstract that derives from keyed hash for hash-based message authentication codes. 
A uh, random number generator is also on this list. And this, this actually uh, surprises some people. Um, maybe not like security guys so much, but like your, your average programmer um, probably doesn't think of RNG as, as a cryptographic function, but it really is. Um, there, there are plenty of times when you need 